Good morning. Good morning. And good morning to all of you at home watching today at the seniors' home here in uh, in Sundry. And uh, um, to those of you watching, a special shout out to Linda uh, in Melfort, who's uh, been trying to find our service now for a while. Um, and uh, so special uh, welcome to you, Linda, um, this morning. Um, I also uh, want to uh, say a special welcome to uh, those who are watching from uh, the United States and from Uganda uh, who are watching today. There's quite a, quite a group uh, in Uganda who are watching, so welcome to all of you. And uh, um, welcome to all of you this morning. Um, today is uh, it's a sad day for me. I did not sleep last night at all. At three o'clock in the morning, uh, they announced that Tom Brady has retired from the NFL. <clears throat> and uh, now stop laughing. This meant a lot to me. Next to Wayne Gretzky being sold by Peter Pocklington, who will ever suffer in Hades for what he did. Uh, this has been the, the worst day of my life. Uh, I have been following Brady for 20 years uh, and loving, just loving all of the sports stuff around him. And, and I know, uh, as, as I'll say in my sermon today, you know, he's a rich, entitled, you know, and when I've heard him interviewed, foul-mouthed character, but boy, there's something about that guy that just has so captured the imagination of so many people for so long. It's, it's a sad day. And uh, at least for me, it is. <laughs> and I wrote down the names of you, those of you who clapped. Uh, <laughs> Ben, you're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Anyhow, um, this is our, as I said, our annual meeting Sunday, and uh, we worship today. This is also the fourth Sunday in Epiphany, and uh, we worship today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We begin with the brief order for confession and forgiveness. And uh, you at home um, uh, can follow along. Uh, I'm sure uh, you can just uh, close your eyes and uh, uh, pray along with us. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, we pray that you cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us just take a few moments now and consider those things we have said and done this past week and those things we should have done and didn't do. And let us offer those up to our Heavenly Father and ask our, our, our Lord for forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we will delight in your will 
and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sin. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Let us sing our first hymn, Hallelujah, we sing your praises. And uh, if you have a, a cranberry hymnal at home, uh, it's number 535, 535. I wonder if I pointed this at the screen, would that work? Maybe they could see the words. Oh, we'll try that. See if you can follow it along. sang that hymn before. I don't know that one at all. Um, is that, that's a common hymn that, that, for this congregation, isn't it? The Lord be with you. If you'd open up your celebration sheets, we will pray together the collect of the day. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Praise the Lord, all ye nations. Extol him, all ye peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the, faithful, and the faithfulness of the Lord endureth forever. Ascribe unto the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering, and come unto his courts. The psalm this morning is Psalm 10, 16 through 8 and uh, the traditional antiphon. Um, men, we will read up to the asterisk, and women, if you would complete the verses, please. So men, let us together. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed. So that the man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. We'll have our readings at this time from Jeremiah and from 1 Corinthians. Thank you. 
this go off? Yep. The Old Testament reading from Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth, for it is for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, uh, but have no love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, loves all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for today is from Luke 4, 31 through 44. I'd ask you all to please rise. Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come forth. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever. And they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and he rebuked the fever and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. 
And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news to the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Here ends the gospel. Christ. You may be seated. I'm going to get you to sing over here. Okay. And we'll sing our next hymn, uh, Break Now the Bread of Life. And again, if you have a red hymnal, a cranberry hymnal, it's number 515. sermon prepared and then heard that Tom Brady was retiring so I changed my sermon I also uh, not sleeping last night was watching uh, YouTube and they were showing uh, the athletes leaving for the Olympics and uh, they were so excited and uh, the theme for Olympic athletes is and always has been uh, faster, higher, stronger. Uh, you know, every year records are broken. It, it, it almost seems impossible that they could be, but they are. Just how fast can a man run every year or woman? I'm sorry. Uh, every Olympic Games records are broken. Is there an ending? Is there uh, some kind of wall that we will one day hit where we simply cannot run any faster? But this very familiar trilogy is one that we hear at the beginning of every Olympic Games when the president of the Olympic Committee stands up and has the athletes swear an oath to uh, act responsibly and fairly and to seek this faster, higher, stronger uh, mantra that is uh, brought forward at every Olympic Games. Now, how many of you watch the Olympics? Yeah, I, I think most people, the opening ceremonies and the closing ceremonies, they're always really super cool. I. I remember in Calgary when we had the Winter Olympics there. You remember when Katie Lang sang at the end? Remember? And, and the whole Olympic 
you know, the, 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 the field filled with athletes dancing to her rockabilly uh, music. I, I sang in a choir with Katie Lang for uh, a year at Red Deer College. And so seeing her singing at the Olympics was amazing. And uh, when, when Valerie and I uh, were married uh, in our second year, we went to Saskatoon to seminary. And when we arrived in Saskatoon, we rented an old, uh, Valerie would tell you, a very gross old house. And uh, the Olympics were just starting. And I remember we didn't even unpack. We just threw a mattress on the floor and watched the whole week of Olympics from top to bottom. It was so much fun. And uh, so qu quite a fan. And there are always amazing stories that come out of the Olympics. My very favorite story about the Olympics is about a guy, and I can't even pronounce his last name, Eric Musama Bani uh, from Equatorial Guinea. Uh, he competed in the 100 meter freestyle. Uh, this was, I think at the Sydney games. I think it was the Sydney games. And he only learned to swim a few days, few weeks before the Olympics. But because he was the only person who came forward in his country, he got to represent them in the swimming pool. Now he trained diligently for almost an hour a day at a local hotel where he swam in their 15 meter pool. This is, I'm not, not making this up. The, the trouble is an Olympic swimming pool is 50 meters and he had never swam more than the width of this little 15 meter puddle uh, his whole time. And when it came time for the race, he found out he had to swim to the other side and back again, 100 meters. And so in front of 17,500 fans, he set out and everyone else dived in the water. He jumped into the water and came up dog paddling and slowly but surely crossed the first 50. Halfway back, he almost drowned, but somehow got back up and dog paddled to the end. Did any of you, do any of you remember this? And he was 70th out of 70 swimmers, and his time was five times slower than the slowest next athlete. But he had heard that they would fly him for free to Sydney, and he could eat for the two weeks of the Olympics for free. And since he had no food where he lived, uh, this was a pretty good deal. So it turns out that he ended up being a competitor in a way that no one else ever imagined. Well, that's wonderful. Now, granted that this is an exception. Most of the 10,000 athletes, and there are now 10,000 athletes who come to this competition, they train their pants off eight, 10, 12 hours a day. Uh, Valerie and I had a little bit to do with gymnastics because our, our daughter got into it uh, a bit when we were, where was that when we did that? Oh, Red, in Red Deer, wasn't it? And we ran into some kids who were training seven hours a day, seven days a week, and had been their whole lives. And they were nowhere near Olympic caliber. I can't even imagine what would go into that. Now, it's not much of a stretch to imagine that were he around and were it possible, one of those two million plus spectators who attend the Olympics would have been the Apostle Paul. Matter of fact, he talks about the Olympics on a number of occasions. Well, not the Olympics, but sports. 
And as all the sports metaphors that dot his epistles indicate, Paul was a fan. And he must have regularly attended games of running and wrestling and, and most certainly boxing. And my reason for writing this message today is this announcement I heard last night at three in the morning that Tom Brady was retiring. And as I, I said earlier, it hurt almost as much as the day Peter Pocklington, who deserves the condemnation of the whole world, sold Wayne Gretzky. I actually pulled over and cried. I, I, I really did, the day that they sold Edmonton's crown prince. And uh, I have been such a huge fan of Tom Brady. And yes, as I said, I, I know he's a rich, spoiled, foul-speaking, sometimes over-entitled athlete. But his competitive spirit is the kind of stuff Paul wrote about. Motivated by always being an underdog, Brady was always, always considered to be much less than he ever lifted himself to be. He was told all along that he wasn't good enough, he wasn't fast enough, he, he wasn't something enough. And yet he ended up winning more Super Bowls than any even franchise in the NFL. I know what that's about. When I was in grade eight, I heard the doorbell late at night. I was lying in bed and dad answered the door and one of my teachers walked in and I overheard him tell my father that he and mom should stop encouraging me to attend university because I just didn't have what it takes and that I should be considering something much less than a higher education. Boy, did that light my fire. And Brady's story is sort of the same thing and it resonated with me. And Paul understood this kind of work ethic. And he writes about this in scripture. Paul understood that we have to train. He uses the language of training when he says you have to press forward. You have to stretch, you have to push, you have to strain. Words that make your lungs burn, your temples pound and your muscles ache. And at the end of it all, Paul talks about victory. And that victory is the crown awarded to every winner. The Super Bowl, a university degree, a follower of Jesus, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I understand that. You understand that. That challenge to attain excellence, to settle for nothing less than being the best that you can be. Competitors use every edge to come out on top. Hopefully all of them legal, but sometimes even illegal, as the continued doping scandals continue, and I'm sure this Olympic Games will have many of those stories yet again. In recent years, one of those edges has been the use of sports psychologists. This past summer, Valerie and I uh, went on holidays to Victoria and 
we didn't know uh, that the Canadian Olympic rowing team was, you know, working out in Victoria. I guess we should have because it's the best place in Canada to do that because the water never freezes and uh, they can work year round. But most days, she and I would have our lunch at a restaurant that was right on the ocean and we could ride our bikes right to the gate and uh, walk around a little fence and, and sit and have lunch. But to get there, we drove through the training area for the Canadian Olympic rowing team. And one day, uh, Valerie was uh, busy doing something. I brought my bike a little closer to listen to them. And they were being taught by a sports psychologist. And there was a whole bunch of them sitting in a circle on the dock and this fellow was speaking. And as I listened to him, I just kept over and over in my mind imagining Paul saying those very same words because he talked about straining forward, you know, never looking back at what was behind, but always looking forward. You know, not living in the past, not allowing your past to constantly be dredged up and laid out before you, bringing you down for any mistakes or errors you've made in your life, but instead looking only forward and, you know, working towards excellence. Paul had the same insight. According to our brief lesson, he knew that mental preparation was crucial to running this spiritual race called the Christian life. Forgetting what is behind, not being a slave to old disappointments, defeats, or hurts. Positive thinking. Now you and I may never be world-class athletes. I really doubt that there will ever be another Tom Brady. I just don't know how it would be possible. But we can be world-class Christians. We can excel in our faith. Listen to advice that comes from the sports psychologists and then baptize it. Put it in the name of Christ instead of in the name of some athletic pursuit. And first, what I heard that fellow say that day was set goals. One of the things I loved about Brady was watching and reading about his training techniques. This guy spent over a million dollars a year looking after his body, the food and the exercise and the training so that he could be the best at what he did. His diet and his dedication to attain his goal. How much energy do we put into being better Christians? To being better disciples for Jesus? How much effort do we put into being the best that we can be for Jesus? Bible study. Prayer. Attendance at church. Some particular service to be performed in the name of Jesus that will help you grow and make you a better disciple. How many take the time to come to Bible study and to learn more about the Word of God? And just as with athletes working with training partners, we as Christians can encourage and strengthen each other. As you go on, be prepared to adjust your levels and keep setting higher goals. As a congregation too, we set goals. Coming up now in February, we are going to start the Alpha program. That's just three weeks away. The only way the Alpha program works is if we as a congregation, you know, set out to make it work to invite new people in, to bring people, to not just, you know, say to them, we'd love you to come sometime, but instead, I'll be there to pick you up, 
and I'd like you to come. I'll bring you myself. And just as with athletics, we can be partners with each other to encourage each other to help each other. Second, this fellow, I remember him talking about focusing. When you're ready to start any athletic endeavor, clear out the mental clutter. I heard Tom Brady interviewed one time and he said that when he's on the field, he doesn't hear a sound from the stands. He had worked with sports psychologists so much that he could turn it off. And, and I know that major league pitchers are the same way. When they're about to throw the ball, they can simply turn off the noise around them and focus with all their might on the batter and throwing the ball. Wouldn't it be amazing if as Christians we could stay focused on the goal that is Christ Jesus? Once we start, we are to keep concentrating on the task at hand. And that task, of course, is to bring people to win souls for Jesus. And third, the psychologist talked about using stress productively. Boy, I know stress. And I'll bet you know stress too. But most stress in our lives tears us down. Stress causes, you know, high blood pressure. It, it can throw your back out. It can put a crink in your neck. Stress can cause all sorts of ailments. But that psychiatrist, psychologist, I'm sorry, was talking about using stress productively. And competitive athletes know that stress can be turned into motivation. The same is true with our Christian faith. We can take the problems of this world and we can cry out, oh, woe is me. Or we can take those same problems and use them to motivate us. Let the stress be a challenge, not a reason to quit. And finally, you have to visualize crossing the line. That guy talked about when you're rowing, you have to visualize the tip of your boat crossing ahead of all the others. Close your eyes. Picture the completion of your task. Again, listening to Tom Brady talk about, you know, receivers running routes. And how before he throws the ball, when he's in the huddle, he can see the runners running their routes. He can focus on it. He knows precisely where they're going to be. So that when he throws the ball, he's not even throwing it to the person. He's throwing it to a place. It's up to the person to be in that place. Where they had practiced so much. Even crossing that finish line. Visualize that. Visualize hearing your Lord and Savior say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Visualize the receiving line of family and friends who will be there to welcome us. And when we cross the finish line into paradise. The Barcelona Olympics of 1992 provide a wonderful parable. And I am sure most of you can remember this. Britain's Derek Redmond, he had dreamed all of his life of winning the 400 meter race. And his dream was in sight as the gun sounded in the semifinals. And he was the favorite. 
He was running the race of his life and could see the finish line. And as he rounded the turn into the back stretch, suddenly he felt a sharp pain go up the back of his leg and he fell flat onto the track. His hamstring had completely torn free. As the medical attendants were approaching, Redmond got to his face and feet and waved them away and started hopping in a crazed attempt to finish the race. When he reached the stretch, a large man in a t-shirt came charging out of the stands. Three or four security guards tried to stop him and he simply threw them aside and ran out onto the field and embraced his son. It was Redmond's dad. Jim Redman. And you don't have to do this, he told his son. Yes, I do, said Derek. Tears streaming down this kid's face. Well then, said Jim, we're going to finish it together. You remember this, right? You've all seen this. And with his son's arm over his shoulder, he dragged and lifted this kid of his, all the way to the finish line. Now he obviously did not win the gold, but he walked away knowing he gave his all. And the incredible memory of his father, who when he saw his son in pain came to help. Derek was never alone. His father was there watching over him. You are never alone. Your heavenly father is at your side, helping you every step of the way. And when you fall, he will help you rise. And he will encourage you faster, higher, stronger, whatever your goal. Seek it in the name of Christ Jesus. And he will be there to help you over the finish line. Amen. Uh, our next, next hymn is... Uh, my Faith Looks Up to Thee, number 759 in the red hymnal at home, Cranberry Hymnal.
Continue, we continue with our confession of faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We ask you all to please rise. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, I'll say goodbye to you at home. Uh, may the Lord bless and keep you. And uh, we will see you again uh, next Sunday at 1030 uh, here in Sundry. Um, if you would like to join us for Bible study, uh, we are studying uh, the book of Genesis Thursdays at three o'clock. And if you text me, I can send you the appropriate number. You can join us on Zoom. And uh, we can have up to uh, 20 different uh, venues watching. So if you would like to be part of the Genesis Bible study uh, Thursdays at 3 o'clock, uh, like I said, text me sometime between 1.30 and 3. And I can uh, actually closer to between 2 and 3 because I, I don't have the number till then. And uh, I can give you the number you need to punch in to join us for the Bible study. And uh, also, if you are a regular uh, uh, member of watching regularly, please consider also sending us an offering as, of course, we struggle with finances like every little church these days. And uh, also, if you would like the address for that, you can text me and I will uh, make sure that you get the address for our church. With that, I say goodbye and love you lots and we'll see you next Sunday.